yeah, oh yeah. You were faithful then, you'll be faithful now. Boy, we believe that, don't we? Mm-hmm. Only God, whoo, only God can do those things. My goodness, that is just awesomely good. Thank you, guys. Appreciate that so much. That's just such a wonderful word for all of us. Good, encouraging words for our lives and for everything that, uh, that we stand for and all that we, that we believe in, want to do, and trust the Lord for in our life. That is so good, I'm telling you. This time of year, I love this time of year, but this is the time of year where those fall pollens get to messing me up. I don't know if they mess you up. <clears throat> and I'm sitting there going, how in the world can they sing these high... I mean, they're, they're up there high all the time. <laughs> and I'm going, man, bless them, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, but anyway, uh, I don't know how many of you are affected by all that kind of stuff, but uh, we'll, we'll pray for each other about it, all right? We are, uh, we've been dealing with, for the last uh, several weeks, an emphasis about, uh, about some laws of love. And I'm not sure if you've ever even heard of the laws of love, uh, I, of course, preached on marriage, family relationships, and all of that for all of these years of ministry, and uh, never really thought about what I'm sharing with you in the way that I'm, I'm sharing it with you now. Of course, Genesis 2 is a very uh, famous passage of Scripture, the whole chapter, all of the, the first chapters of Genesis, because we read them so often, and, and messages come from them, and there are quotes that are out of them, and, and, and they're parts of points and scriptures and so forth. So anyway, we're, most of us are very familiar with Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 20, when the Lord uh, creates for Adam what he considers the perfect helpmate, Someone suited in every way to meet the needs of Adam, and Adam was, was built to meet her needs. So we're talking about uh, a new creation that God said uh, it would be good for Adam. It was not good for him to be alone. So he created this wonderful, uh, wonderful new creation for Adam by putting him to sleep, taking the rib from his side, and closing it back up and fashioning her in such a way as to be so totally overwhelmingly attractive to Adam that he would just be blown away. And of course, when he saw her, he made a statement about that, about her bones and her flesh, and it looks like a completely non-romantic statement. It looks like a, you know, hey, <laughs> he's a pretty sterile guy, you know. Uh, but it was really a tremendously romantic, a tremendously great statement because he was speaking to the fact that 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 she looked like him, that she was the, had the same kind of bones that he had, that she had the same kind of skin that he had, and that God had done a wonderful job. As a matter of fact, I've heard some people interpret what Adam said by using just that, that wolf whistle, you know, that... That that was some of the some of the Hebrew scholars said that's really what what it basically boiled down to, and uh, but anyway he was greatly impressed and satisfied and and overwhelmed with her and then as soon as he received her from God he made a couple of statements in verses twenty four and twenty five that look like they are just kind of afterthoughts. They appear in, in many marriage ceremonies, actually, these words do. And, um, and, and it, it just looks like, okay, this is just a little general statement here. But they become very significant when you begin to think about what he's actually saying in, in, in something more than just a, a, a filler, you know, like you're filling some verses with some words. And the words are... Uh, Therefore, because this person has been given to me and she's bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh and she'll be called woman because she's been taken from man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they too shall become one flesh. Now that is just tremendously significant in itself in that you know that Adam and Eve had no mom and no dad. So obviously... When, when, when the Lord does things like this, like these verses, when, they, when you see things spoken to people that it doesn't apply to them, obviously, the Lord was saying, this is not for them, this is for all of the generations that will come after them. That's right, that's 
all of the generations that will have a mother and a father. And that mother and father will be their primary relationship from the time they're born until the time they're old enough to marry and leave home. That is the number one relationship in their life. It is, there, are, there is no uh, higher priority in life in relationships than parents and children. So what he's saying here is, we're going, when you give yourself in covenant to a mate, you have just created a covenant bond that has a higher priority than your relationship with your mother and your father does. Which means that your marriage becomes number one. It is the highest priority of your life. Higher than work, higher than school, higher than the children, higher than any uh, uh, opportunity for recreation, higher than everything. And marriage is number one or it doesn't work. Uh, not that you can't hold on, like I've said before, and not that you can't drag it out and, and endure it, but it's not gonna be what God intended for it to be. How many of you would love to have the marriage that God intends for you to have? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Now, I know some of you are without mates now, and you may be saying to yourself, shoot, man, I'm never getting married again. You know? <laughs> well, I know that's what we say. But I'm telling you, I've been in the ministry for how many years? 48 now? And I have seen people that have said that for years of their life, and then all of a sudden, boop, tilt, bingo, ding. Bells go off, buzzers go off. And I said, I thought you said you weren't ever going to get married again. Well, I didn't know about her, you know, or something like whatever it might be. So listen, don't just sit there like this doesn't apply to you because I'm telling you, um, you can have the greatest marriage on earth. I mean, this is, this is a 100% success rate. I, I guarantee you, if you will obey these four laws, you will have a successful marriage. You will be happy in your marriage. Your marriage will be fulfilling. It'll be what God intended for it to be. And if you don't, it's going to be messed up. That's just all it is to it. it it's, going to be, it's going to be less than what it could be. So he says, uh, leave your father and mother, cleave to your wife. Leaving your father and mother is the first law of love, and it's the law of priority. The second law of love is the second thing up there where you cleave to your wife. Now, cleave is a, is a word we don't use uh, very often. It's kind of an old-fashioned word. It comes from the Hebrew word davak, and davak means to pursue with all your energy. It means to glue or to weld, and then uh, a secondary meaning would be uh, to pursue with all your energy. And in this case of marriage, both of those apply, you know. Stick, glue, weld, you know, <laughs> where you can be broken. And, and, and you do this by pursuing with all your energy. And I, I started talking to you about uh, the fact that when we pursue with all of our energy, what this does is it creates an attitude in us of servanthood, that we would serve one another, that our life would be given in order to serve someone else besides, our, besides us. And that it took a lot of energy, actually, to pursue with all of your energy. It takes a lot of, um, it takes a lot of commitment to do that. It takes a lot of, 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 of energy and, and, and thriving to, do, to pursue someone with all of your energy. And so uh, I started talk by talking about the fact that there are two reasons why we need to serve each other. And they are... Number one, I can't meet all my needs. I have psychological needs. I have emotional needs. I have physical needs, of course. And I have, I have spiritual needs. I have, uh, you know, I, I have social needs. I, I, there, I have all kind of needs as a man and you as a, as a woman that you cannot meet on your own. So God draws you to someone, and, and I've always been amazed at how people choose their mate. You know, isn't it, isn't it interesting? I mean, don't you see some unusual connections in life? I'm thinking, man, how did they ever get together? It's just unbelievable. I met a couple recently that he is a farmer. I mean, he, nothing wrong with being a farmer. Farmer's great. Um, but you would think that someone who is a farmer would attract a mate 
that would be kind of in the rural thinking of life and, you know, kind of be a farmer's wife kind of mentality of life. You know who he married? I don't know how long they've been married, probably 30 years or so. They've been married a long time. He married a woman that graduated with a fine arts degree in some type of uh, 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 ancient painting uh, mastery of some kind of something like that. I mean, like I'm going, how did you guys? How did you guys get together? A farmer and 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 this art major, uh, sophisticated, you know, uh, hoity-toity, uh, painty stuff like that. You know, how, what would ever, what, how did you get together? And what would make you ever think you could stay together? Because you live in two different worlds. You, you, it's just totally different. Well, you know the old phrase, opposites attract. Well, they do. And uh, we're completely opposite. And I hope you know that. I think you do. But if you marry somebody just like you, I can't even imagine how boring a life that would be. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be a boring life? Man, you come home to somebody just like you every day who thinks like you and looks like you, acts like you. Man, thank you, Lord, that you do that. But anyway, my point being that there are all kinds of things that attract us to each other, so God must be involved in it. Because it can't be explained by simple, uh, how would you explain it, you know? It's just two guys meet across a crowded room. Bing, you know, chill bumps run up and down my spine <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and then, and, and, and there's something about it and you're drawn to each other. And then the reason that you keep staying with each other is because you meet each other's needs. This is how you know that you are meeting someone's needs because you stay with them and their, uh, their interest in you grows and you eventually get married and, and, you know, and become a unit and so forth. That testify, that's a testimony that you've met my needs and I met your needs. Out of all the, out of all the women in the world, why, why would I fall in love with Tanya? And I mean, I dated bunches of girls when I was in high school and all that kind of stuff. I mean, uh, you know, I'm not Mr. Romance or anything, but I mean, there were lots of, you, you guys did too. I mean, you were, you know, you, you were, uh, you had people around you. You had uh, other women, other men. You, you, I mean, this was like, yeah, and, and, and how in the world did, did one just captivate you so much that you would leave all the others and you would only, only think of them, only pursue them? Well, it was because you sensed that they could meet your needs and you could meet their needs. And God called you together so that you could be one. So... What happens to us in many times, the reason, reason marriages become failures is not because the people in them aren't wonderful people. It's just that you stop doing what you did when you fell in love with each other. In other words, you stop meeting each other's needs. You become lazy. You get complacent. You don't pay attention. You develop a bad attitude. It's false advertising, it basically is what it's been. Before, you remember the store analogy? You, you, you had a wonderful store. You were going to, about to go into business to find a mate. You put all the nice things in the window, dressed it up, cleaned it up, put an open for business sign on the door, open the door, customer comes in, future mate, potential mate comes in. You're so friendly and warm and welcoming. Oh, come on in. It's so nice to see you. Oh, thank you for coming in my store today. It's just so good. That's so exciting. You're my first customer to come in today. Do I have what? Do I have what? You, you know, yes, I do. I sure do. Let me get it for you. And I get off the, yes, is this what you were looking for? Oh, okay, great. Well, hey, that's a wonderful thing, and, and that's great. And, uh, do I, do I you have, yeah, I got some more of that, and I, you know, that's your attitude. Yeah, yeah. That's how you, you're so friendly, you're so warm, you're so welcoming, you're so inviting. Until you, someone becomes a loyal customer, 
And when they become a loyal customer, you start taking them for granted. You get lazy. Uh, you don't put the items on the shelf and all these things. So, so look, we need to serve each other because we have needs that we can't meet, and we need to keep our shelves stocked because the, of the second reason, I'm sworn to fidelity, which simply means I'm committed to you, and if you don't have the merchandise on your shelf, I can't go to another store. So keep it stocked because I'm at your mercy. All right, and then I started talking about four or five reasons why this is hard to do. Selfishness is one of them. Um, pride and domination is the other. Worldly concept of success and ignorance of God's nature. Those were some problems, and, and get the message. It, it, it's there everywhere. All right, last week I, I came into the servant's rules. I, got some, I got, have five rules for you about being a servant. If you're gonna do this, if you're gonna pursue with all your energy, how, what, how do you do it? What is it? How, would, how does this look? What do I do? All right, number one was uh, serve what your spouse needs despite what you need, what you want, or what you understand. I don't understand why you need It doesn't matter whether you understand. That's a need. They told you that, right? Honey, I need, or honey, I wish you would, or baby, would you? And then, and when they say that, believe them. When they, when they tell you what you need, what they need, then it's your responsibility to provide it. Now, we don't sin to meet each other's needs, but short of sin, it's your job to meet their needs. That's what, that's what a covenant is. A covenant is a permanently sacrificial relationship. That's what a covenant is. We are in a covenant with God. A permanently sacrificial relationship with God. That's what we have. So whatever God would ask of us, it's our responsibility as, as a covenant relationship member to provide that. So whether you understand it or not, whether you need it or not, because you'll be, you, you be thinking, why, they don't need that. Why do they need that? Nobody would need that. I don't, I don't understand what. I mean, no, no, that, despite what you need, what you think or what you understand, it, it's your responsibility to supply that. Remember the restaurant from last week. All right, second uh, rule is enjoy serving your spouse and do it with a joyful attitude. If you serve your spouse with a joyful attitude, it shows them that you love them, that you value them, and that they are a priority in your life. If you roll your eyes, you know, 65, the, the communication experts tell us that 65% of the communication we have with each other is nonverbal, right? which means no words are involved. It means body language, uh, facial expressions, sounds, uh, math. You know, I mean, all kinds of ways. You know what I'm saying when I do that. Well, I need for, honey, I, I, this is what I need. I, it's been a long time. And I, uh, uh, All right, that's a bad attitude. That, you know what a bad attitude says? A bad attitude says, you're not very precious to me, and you're a really pretty low priority in my life. And I don't really care what you need. And so you, you serve your mate with, with, with excitement, with, in, with a good attitude, with a, enjoy serving your mate. Because it does make a difference, right? I mean, come on, give me some enthusiasm. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, look, don't just kind of do what I'm asking or, you know, I mean, give me some like, I'm happy to do this. Praise God, you know. You remember our word last week? My pleasure, my pleasure. Makes a difference. All right, here's the R. R is reject scorekeeping and do what you do with a spirit of grace and faith. Reject scorekeeping. 
And I guarantee you, if I ask you, and I'm not going to ask you because I don't want to start a fight, my job is not to increase more marriage counseling, it's to save some. I would ask you, how many of you have mates that keep score? You know, don't raise your hand. It's time to now look just straight ahead. Don't look at them. Uh, yeah. yeah, we have mates that keep score. You know what? This says if you're going to serve someone and you're going to pursue them, this, this law says, all right, now, uh, you're to pursue them with all of your energy and you are to serve them. And if you're going to serve them, you can't, you can't keep score. Because scorekeeping implies what? I mean, if I keep score in a game, what does that imply? It implies that you must earn this, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, why would I keep score if, if, if it didn't mean anything? Well, what it means is you haven't done anything for me lately, so why should I do something for you? That's scorekeeping, and what I'm saying is you, 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 can't, you can't have a love relationship like that because it's not what you earn or what you deserve. This is a sacrificial covenant relationship. Let me just show you what, all right, First Peter, here, here's, a good, here's a good word. This is, this, is the whole, this is God speaking through First Peter or through Peter. All right, he says, for to this, First Peter 2.21, for to this you were called. Now this sounds like he's about to give us a purpose here, right? He says, this is why I called you. Okay, this is, for this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Now that might not sound like much of a verse, but let me show you what he's talking about. When we were in our sins, Christ was dying for us. Am I right about that? Because Christ suffered for us. Because he did that, that is called, by the way, redemptive love. So Christ, Jesus suffered for you, and he left you an example to follow. And the first place that that example of his footsteps appears in the next, right, this, this is at the end of the second chapter, the starting of the first chapter, of the third chapter, is all about love, marriage, and relationships. Now I'm gonna read just a couple of verses out of there and show you what I'm talking about. In other words, Jesus, this verse says, that when Jesus was here, Jesus died for us when we were still in our sins. He suffered for us when we were still sinners, when we were rejecting him, when we were taunting him, when we were belittling him, when we were, didn't care about him. He suffered for us. And that suffering for us in spite of the fact that we weren't acting right is the perfect example that he left for us. And he said, you do like I did. And the first example he gives is marriage. Let me, let me just show you what I mean. Uh, ladies, first ver first, these first verses are for you. All right, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, which is the next chapter right after this. Here they are. Wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands. Let me, let me, give, a, let me give a disclaimer here real quick. All right, here's the disclaimer. The disclaimer is these verses are not talking about being abused. If you're being abused, now I'm going to, in the next message, in the next law, I'm going to talk all about abuse and about how to handle it when you're being abused and what to do and what God says about it and all that kind of stuff. Now, the whole message is not about that, but, but it's in there. It's part of it. So just suffice it right now to say that when we read these verses, I, I, we're, we're not talking about somebody who is being abused. To be abused is to be hurt. It, it, it could be physical, it could be emotional, it could be mental, psychological. Uh, uh, no, God doesn't give anyone the right to abuse another person. 
And so I'm not talk, this is not talking about deeply troubled marriages where somebody's slapping you around or they're, they're belittling you or they got you chained to the bedpost. Or they, I mean, this is talking about normal um, relational things where somebody is neglecting you. Somebody is not doing what they should do. This is, this is words to a wife when their husband, husbands aren't acting like they should toward them. And so he says, all right, wives, when your husband is not treating you the way he should, here's the word to you. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. All right, let me interpret that. When your husband is not acting like he should act. Remembering now that this has to do with the example that Jesus left, that when, we, when he suffered for us when we didn't deserve it, and we're to follow those, that, that example, he says, wives, when your husbands aren't treating you with respect and, and, and treating you the way he should be treating you, you be responsive to his needs. And you, and in spite of the fact that he might be indifferent to any words about God, he doesn't want to hear about God. He doesn't want to think about God. He's had God up to here. And he's not treating you right. All right, you treat him right. You, you, you be responsive to his needs anyway. And... And, and even if he doesn't want to hear about God at all, he's going to be challenged by the fact that your holy life of beauty captivates him in spite of the fact that he's not doing what he should do. The Holy Spirit is going to begin to challenge him when he sees your beautiful, holy life. So just treat him right in spite of the fact he doesn't deserve it. Now, he's not finished there. The next verse, verse three, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging of the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Now, the only thing I, I, I would say here is, do I underline the word merely? Okay, I, I should have underlined the word merely because there are whole denominations that have started from this verse. You know, don't wear makeup, don't wear jewelry, don't, don't uh, you know, uh, the, the people that believe that's, that's holy. Notice that that verse doesn't say don't wear any. It doesn't say don't let any of your, <laughs> don't, don't give any concern, don't give concern about any of this. It just says uh, don't, give, don't give major concern about this. Don't let it be merely this, not, not any of this. I mean, thank God for makeup and everything, you know. <laughs> thank God. I need some myself, you know. I wish I could. But anyway, so, all right, ladies. So, you know, uh, uh, pretty yourself up, uh, but don't get too out of bounds with this. Don't get out of whack. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart. That's talking about your inner disposition. Uh, with the in incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. So, so what, what, is this, what is this saying to us, guys? It, it, this, it's saying, when your husband's not acting right, respect your husband and treat him better than he deserves. That's redemptive love. Jesus treats us better than we deserve. If I got what I deserved, I would go to hell and die because I'm a sinner, right? But Jesus, in that when I was a, while I was yet a sinner, he died for me. He suffered for me. So he treated me better than I deserved to be treated. And this is what, this is what Peter, through the Holy Spirit through Peter, is saying to wives in a marriage that, look, if your husband is not meeting your needs, he's not treating you right, he's not holding you as a precious vessel like he should, don't. 
disrespect him. You treat him better than he deserves. And when you treat him better than he deserves, the Holy Spirit is going to get involved in this thing and it's going to have an impact onto his life and change him. Do you know, and I said this, in, I think, in one of the first couple of messages, that honor is so powerful to men that if you will treat a man with honor, you will change the way he thinks about you. You'll change the way he acts toward you. I've seen it happen so many times on the job, at work, all kind of places. Man, if you, just, if you treat with somebody with respect, a man, it's going to change the way he thinks about you. And if you want to change your husband, don't treat him with disrespect. If you treat him with disrespect, then you're, you're just going to push it further away. Treat him with respect, in fact, in spite of the fact that he's not treating you right and God will get involved in this thing and he'll bless you. Remember, this is the example that Jesus left us. This is the example that he said for us to follow in his steps. Now, men, let's talk about us because the next verse is about us. In verse seven, husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. All right, guys, what about us? What about, what about when your wife's on your last nerve? What about when they're not doing right? They're not, they're not, they're not, they're not supplying what you need. All right, how, what do you do about it? Well, the Holy Spirit through Peter says, all right, Live with your wife with understanding. Understanding what? Well, understanding that she's different from you. Understanding that she doesn't have the same needs that you have. Understanding that she's going to look at things different. You need to understand her. You need to understand that you don't speak the same language, that you don't have the same goals, that you don't deal with people in the same way that you're completely different genders of humanity. God created male and female, not male A and male B. And you are to understand this and to live with her this way and to, and, and, and to study her and to, to know what's going on there. That's, that, that's your job. And then you give honor to your wife as the weaker vessel. And what this is talking about is talking about physically you are the biggest, baddest thing in the house. Now, don't get me wrong, abuse is an equal opportunity offender. And I've seen as many women abusers as, there, as I've seen men abusers. In all kinds of ways, you'd be shocked. A little tiny five foot two somebody beating not somebody with a broom and something. I mean, you'd say, man, he could just break her in half. Well, yeah, he could, but he doesn't, and she just abuses him. I mean, so, all, so we're not, this is, uh, abuse is, is a gender neutral deal, you know. But, but here he's saying, all right, the wife is a little weaker physically. You know why God made women weaker men? So they wouldn't take over the world. <laughs> so he made her a little weaker. And he said, he said and he said, now, um, uh, give her honor, give her honor. Now, what that means is that you, when, you, when you give something honor, you, you put it on a pedestal, right? Because of why? Because it's precious, right? Yeah, it's special. It's, it's precious. Like that little bitty short uh, lady that's about 90 years old in England that they call the queen. When she walks into some place, they treat her with honor because she's precious to them. It's not because she's the greatest warrior. It's not because she can do anything for them. It's just the fact that they consider her to be precious. And when you honor something, you put it on a pedestal because it's precious to you. I mean, it, it, it's like, it's like, uh, like regular uh, 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 cutlery, regular plates uh, and, and fine china. 
I mean, you know, both of them are, are things you can eat off of, and, and, and the regular plate is much thicker and much hardier and probably is more durable and everything else, uh, but, but, the, but, but, but not nearly as precious as fine china. So fine china may be weaker, but it's more precious. And so the verse is saying, you know, you, you must live with your wife understanding what she needs, knowing her, and then you treat her as precious and, 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 and pamper her and put her on a pedestal. And, and, and if you don't do this, he said, then God's not hearing your prayers. He said, make no mistake about it. You're not gonna, God, God's not, God's not, not gonna, gonna listen to your prayer. This just means, guys, that you cannot disassociate the way you treat your wife and your relationship with God. That's how serious this is. God says, if you don't treat her right, I'm not listening to your prayers. So, so your relationship with God is, is, is associated in this deal. In the context here is that when, 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 when she's on your nerves, when she's at the last, our natural response is, you know, like, um, uh, you know, tit for tat. You, you did this, I do this. Uh, you put a knife in my back, I'm gonna put three knives in your back. I mean, that, that's the natural response to things like this, is to treat people the same way they treat you, except maybe just a little more harsh. But let me give you just a little spiritual warfare lesson. Just this is a tiny little spiritual warfare lesson here. The only way that you can defeat a spirit is with the opposite spirit. All right, I'm going to say that one more time. Because I didn't, I didn't really see any response. So let me see. Let's try it one more time. But you guys out there, <laughs> the only way that you can defeat a spirit is with the opposite spirit. That's why Jesus said, love your enemies. Does that make sense? Uh, somebody hates me. Somebody's trying to hurt me. They're gonna abuse me. They're my enemy. And what does Jesus come along and say? Don't hate them back. Don't hurt them back. Don't, don't fight fire with fire. See, that, 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 that's what we think. Well, I'm going I'm to fight fire with fire. Well, you know what happens when you fight fire with fire? You just get a bigger fire. If you want, no, you fight fire with water. And you fight a spirit with the opposite spirit. So let me show you how it works in this little deal here, all right, of, of your mate not doing right. All right, here's how it works. Here, here's how redemptive love works in this deal of your mate not doing right. When they're not doing what they should do, you say to yourself, all right, they're not treating me the way they're supposed to treat me, so what am I gonna do? I've got two choices. I can fight fire with fire. Hey, they're not treating me right. I'm giving them the cold shoulder. Yeah, I'm just, I'm not gonna talk to them. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just, when they talk to me, I'm just, uh, and they'll know, they'll get the picture that something's wrong, right? Yeah, they're gonna know. Uh, uh, or I'm gonna, you know, I'm not gonna speak to them. I'm not, you know, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna say anything. They're gonna ask me a question and I'm just gonna turn my head and just quit, you know. I mean, what, what childish stuff is that? How dysfunctional is that? Uh, it, that's fighting fire with fire. That's saying, you hurt me, I'm gonna hurt you. So you can do that if you want to, but all that's gonna happen is there's gonna be a bigger fire going on. It's gonna be harder to get over. Or you can say to yourself, what did Jesus do when I wasn't acting like Jesus wanted me to act? Oh, Jesus kept loving me in spite of the fact that I didn't act like he wanted me to act. So if I want my husband to start acting right or my wife to start acting right, I need to do what Jesus did when I wasn't acting right. I need to do to them. And presto, boom, there is the opposite spirit. 
when they're not doing right, don't treat them harshly. Treat them lovingly. Treat them kindly. Redemptive love. Get the Holy Spirit involved in it. Or you get the Holy Spirit involved in it, I'll guarantee you things will change. It's so unbelievable. All right, so there you go. That's enough of that. All right, let me give you the V. V is vigilantly protect the priority of your marriage and the time and energy to serve your spouse. Vigilantly protect the priority of your marriage and the time and energy to serve your spouse. It takes energy to serve, right? So what does that mean? That means that you cannot come home every night so drop down dog tired that you just that you can't pay attention. That as soon as you sit down on the couch, you get that stomach full. As soon as you sit down on that couch, your eyes shut, and, and they have to wake you up at 10 o'clock to, get, to go to bed. I mean, that can happen a time or two during the week, you know, or something. I mean, I'm not saying that you don't have some days that are just terrible and you come in so drop down tired. It's ridiculous. You don't, I mean, you can't even, you don't, it's hard to even imagine what's happening in the house, much less anything else. I, I'm not saying you can't ever come home like that. We know that's ridiculous. But I'm just saying you can't do it every night. That, that cannot become your way of living. That, that, that you just come home and you're so tired and you've worn yourself and you've allowed yourself to be worn out and you've done and all this and after work you went and did this because you needed to do this and that just added on top of what you did. You, you, you can't do that every night and expect to have a, a, a great relationship. Listen, the reality of priority is this. If I am your priority, I am going to get the best you have and the most you have. You tell me I'm priority. Remember, law number one is you're priority. You're number one. So you tell me you're number one and, 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 and I'm getting the leftovers. I'm getting what, I'm getting what uh, the we, people at work and the people after work and your buddies that you went out and, and played a ball game with or went golfing or you went, you know, whatever. I mean, you dragging up here and you got about a half ounce of energy and you say, all right, uh, you, you're number one, babe, but, but you don't have anything to give. That's not priority. You're showing them they're not priority. So you have to protect that. You have to protect that energy that it takes to, 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 to serve. Uh, do you know what the greatest danger in marriage is? It's not bad stuff. The greatest danger in marriage is not bad stuff. It's good stuff that's out of priority. It's in the wrong place in priority. I'll give you an example. Children. Not, I mean, children are wonderful. They're, they're, our, they're, they're our, our heritage. We love our children. But you remember a few weeks ago, I mentioned to you that if you don't teach your children how to respect your marriage, you're not going to have a marriage. Because children don't recognize any boundaries. They, 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 they don't care whether they wear you out and you go to bed exhausted, exhausted they, 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 don't, they don't recognize things like that. They're not trying to be evil. They just, they just sap energy. They they're just drain you of all of your emotions and, and, and your energies and all of that. You put them to bed before you even get back to the bed. Mama, I want a drink of water. I just gave you one. Let's see if you can make it through the night. Let's <laughs> see if you can survive until the morning. Uh, I've got to go to the bathroom. you got a diaper on. Use it, would you? Yeah. <laughs> There's a monster under my bed. Good, you got somebody to talk to. Get quiet. Go to bed. Leave us alone. I mean, it, they, will, they will dominate you. They will captivate your soul if you let them. And you can't... I see... Children are not a bad thing. They're a good thing. But if you give them priority, number one, your marriage is gone. 
It's not, it ain't, it is not priority number one. Your mate's not primary, uh, priority number one. Your child is. And it doesn't take much of that to, to be a real big problem going on now. Nobody talks about it, but it's a big deal. So you have to develop things like traditions and, and disciplines to keep your marriage uh, 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 alive. Uh, talking face to face every day. Women, women love to talk face to face. Men love to talk side to side. If you don't believe it, just, just notice how men talk to each other. When men talk to each other, they sit down on a bench and maybe one sits down on that side, one sits down on that side. They don't even look at each other. They just say, hey, hey man, how, how's the day been going for you? Oh, it's been going, you know how work is. It's side by side. Women love talk face to face. That's why when you go into a restaurant, they sit right across from you. They want you to talk face to face. So, hey, develop that. Say, I'm gonna, all right, when I get home from work, we're going to sit down. Now, I'm going to talk face to face. How was your day? All that. Um, um, taking walks together, having, I just wrote down a few things, having a date night every week, uh, taking short trips together as often as you can. You know, these are the kind of things that help keep your marriage first. And, and so you have to vigilantly protect the time and energy to serve each other uh, or else everything in your life will keep sapping your energy and you'll find yourself saying over and over, when we get through this season or when we get over this situation, then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll do this. Well, if you can't do it now, it's no good. Protect your relationship. Protect your energy. That's what you serve each other with. All right, How's it good? How, how can you have a good attitude when you're worn out all the time? <laughs> all right, E. Let me give you the last E. Expect to be blessed and don't get discouraged and give up. Expect to be blessed and don't get, dis get, don't get discouraged and give up. Now, let me read, I'm gonna read a passage that I read earlier and I wanna just show you what it means. Matthew 23, look at these verses, 11 and 12. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Now, verse 12. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a promise to me. Jesus said, he who exalts himself, I promise you, he who exalts himself is gonna be humbled. He who humbles himself is gonna be exalted. Now, to give you an example of what that is, look at what Philippians 2 says about Jesus. Philippians 2 says that Jesus came to this earth and he took the form of a servant. And he humbled himself and became obedient even unto the point of death. And because he did this, God has given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue can, should, should confess to the glory of God the Father. What is that saying? It is saying that if you will humble yourself and serve someone, God will exalt you. If you will do this, God will take care of the energy. God will take care of the initiative. God will take care of the priority. God will move things in your life. God will exalt you. That's the promise. God made Jesus. That's a promise from Jesus. And so as you participate in, in pursuing with all your energy and serving each other, don't get discouraged. You know, you're going to have temporary setbacks. There are going to be times where it seems like, I don't want to do this. Don't look. Just do it. Just do it. And God will exalt you in life. He'll bless you in your life. And this is true about any service that we do in life. It's true about serving each other, serving a church, serving your friend, but especially in relationships. This is, what, this is what keeps re re relationships fresh. This is the cleaving part. This is that gluing together. This is what brings us together because we, we can't meet our needs and we do have a mate that God has put us with that is designed in every way to meet these needs. But we have to pay attention 
And we have to strive to do this. We have to protect this. This is not going to just accidentally happen in your life. And God said, if you do it, I'll bless you. All right, let's bow. Let's bow.